On your Tuesday episode of Locked On Raptors, the Raptors just can't buy a win. An OT loss to the Sixers. Pascal Siakam was incredible. Nobody else really showed up outside of maybe OG Ananobi and Chris Boucher. We will break down all that went down in Philly and try to plot a course course forward for your 13-18 Toronto Raptors. All right, let's get to it. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode number 1305 of Locked On Raptors for Tuesday, December the 20th. I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for nine seasons. It feels like the last two weeks have been nine seasons worth of basketball. Uh, You can find all of my work from those nine years and beyond over on Twitter at Woodley Sean. You can go and support the show on Twitter as well at Locked On Raptors, where you'll find links to every episode of the show. You can also go to your favorite podcast app of choice and subscribe, follow, rate, and or review whatever the app of choice asks you to do to support the shows you like. Go do it. It's much appreciated. Same as it goes for the YouTube channel. Just go hit the big red subscribe button. It's staring you right in the face, right underneath here if you're watching it right now uh, and happen to have stumbled across the show on the algorithm just please hit that subscribe button and you have done a wonderful service to support the show also supporting the show today is our friends over at prize picks they have brought you today's episode they're the first time first time users of prize picks can receive a 100 instant deposit match up to 100 with the promo code locked on that's prizepicks.com promo code locked on more on them a little later all right The Toronto Raptors have now lost six straight games after a 104-101 OT loss to the Sixers in which Pascal Siakam put up 38-15-6, did everything he could except hit the final buzzer-beating three at the end of an overtime in which the Raptors scored exactly two points. Two points, indicative of the struggles of the offense in this one, which is a bummer because the defense played as well as it has in, oh, I don't know, weeks here to break it all down, dig into the big picture stuff. We've got the good, the bad, and the hmm coming up later on as well. We'll probably talk about some trade philosophy and all that. It is our pal from Raptors.com, Vivek Jake, a big V. When will it end? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have an answer to that question because the games coming up are very difficult. Um, yeah. If you don't, yeah, if you don't beat the Knicks, it could get ugly, but um it already is ugly i would pause it but yeah uh <laughs> that's fair that's that's very fair uh, I, yeah i guess yeah i think this team just is, is in such a muck that they keep finding ways to lose like mm-hmm. if you were to watch that stretch where the raptors go up seven with about four minutes remaining mm-hmm. um and the way they played after that if you were to take away the team name, slap some other jerseys on there, you know, you would just assume this was a tanking team. Yeah. Like, oh, no, way... we can't win this game. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, like the way they threw away that game, some of the offensive possessions. Um, there, there was obviously there was the one really unlucky one where uh, I thought they really defended well, but then. Um, they almost get the ball out of Embiid's hands at the end of the clock and he taps it to to, Tobias Harris Mm -hmm. uh, and Tobias Harris hits the three. That was probably the exception. But again, I criticize the scheme there because for me, late clock scenarios just stay home. Yeah. Right. If Embiid's going to take an 18 footer, fine. Like, yeah. yeah. Like once you've got the clock down to, you know, under five, you've done your job. Like yeah. at that point, you don't need to force the turnover. Like just let them take the tough shot. And so even in that possession, it's like, it, yeah, Embiid bobbles it for a second. And then Fred, like Fred was already showing as the help. And then mm-hmm. he fully commits. And that's where Embiid's able to tap to the corner. Like that shouldn't even be an option, right? Mm-hmm. Like if if Pascal goes for it and gets it, great. If not, let it let Embiid just grab the ball and force up a tough shot. So little things like that, um, especially end of clock, like there's no need to help in that situation, especially off the strong corner like that. Um, and then, yeah, you, offensively, uh, you know, 
obviously Pascal had it going from the mid range, but that was like a pretty, like it was almost a three pointer. Like it was a deep, deep two, um, th uh, that he took, uh, after a sixer turnover, Boucher takes a contested above the break three with 13 on the clock. Oh my God, like, man. The, the, what is that the couple about? of those Boucher looks, I know he hit the weird fade away. That was fun and yeah. cool when it went down and totally shocking. But the shocking nature of it perhaps suggests don't take those shots again, Chris. Yeah. And then there's the there's a bad double again. And then the rotation isn't there. Melton gets the open three. Uh Fred gets a wide open three, misses that. And and then before you know it, the Sixers are in the lead again. So mm -hmm. that was where the game shifted. I mean, we can probably talk about that second quarter as well, but mm -hmm. once the Raptors had taken the lead so late. To see them uh, just throw it away like that was tough and, you know, kind of emblematic of this entire stretch. Yeah, it really, I, I think you're spot on there. Like, this was such an encapsulation of what's gone wrong most of the time. Look, there have been some total stinker no-show losses in this mix as well, but there have also been a lot of games where they have played well in some facet of the game whether it's the offense doing pretty well or the defense finally coming around against the Sixers it just speaks to the razor thin margins they're working with because they can't get both ends to be working at the same time and I don't know really what you're supposed to do Fred Van Vliet goes two of 11 from three look I think Fred Van Vliet ultimately will be fine. Things are amplified right now because every miss contributes potentially to another loss, which contributes to more paranoia, more getting out of touch with the top of the Eastern Conference, more work you got to do to sort of turn this ship around. And so there's like a heft to all of his misses. Like the, the way I deflated when that wide open three late in that game off of the Siakam, you know, attention and kick it, like just completely deflating because that's a shot Fred Van Vliet has hit in his career is supposed to hit in the role he occupies on this team and I'm all for patience I have preached patience with this team the entire season it's kind of my whole mo when it comes to team building I think overreacting to a losing stretch is a good way to sort of compound and add to your problems down the line but at some point douche has got to hit shots at some point the team has to find a way to play on both ends of the floor like a good team. At some point, you have to start picking up wins because as much as the process is there and there are positive signs and, oh, maybe they're coming out of it, every single additional loss makes it that much more difficult, that much more sort of uh, circle-y the tank vultures are going to become, that, mu that many more calls you're going to get from teams who are like, can we have one of your good players, please? Like, it, it, it just, it's all so amplified now and it gets more amplified with every loss and at some point like you just got to do the thing and I know that's easy for me to say in my chair in my office you know with a, the only basketball I've touched in the last little while is this little stupid basketball that I shoot at my basketball net in the back here sometimes with my wife gets mad because I break stuff but uh like it, it's it's just at some point you have to tie it all together. Otherwise, you're just bad. And I, I don't think this is a bad team, but I also kind of feel like I'm sitting here like holding the empty bag. Like, look, it's coming around. Don't worry. It's going to come. And then it's just it's never going to turn around. I don't think that's the case. But at this point, I mean, you have to just find a way. And I know that's very simplistic and reductive, but you're running out of time here to turn this ship around every additional loss makes it that much more difficult and like you said the schedule ain't getting any easier i don't know man what, at what point do you say this is a lost cause like is there a time you know a, a number of losses a, a record or a win percentage that it dips to where you're just like all right well this like you throw your hands up it's not worth it like I, for me i think there's a lot of value in trying to salvage this regardless because you have Scotty Barnes and Pascal Siakam. The desire to get reps at the postseason is still a thing. It's valuable. We've seen it for teams like the Grizzlies and Pelicans. Getting there, getting into that pressure cooker actually does matter. It can be a launching point. I still think there's plenty of stuff to play for, but at what point does it get to the point where it's just like, okay, well, like you have to sort of maybe pivot your thinking because they just can't win games. I'd probably say the middle of next month. Yeah. Is like January 15th ish. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I th and again, like more players become eligible for trade as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's probably what you look at in terms of shifting the season one way. But mm -hmm. I, I do think uh, as of right now, uh, I do believe Vision 6-9 is over. I think yeah. there's enough evidence that it's one option um, that you can go to at times, but uh, you have to have a legit legitimate big man. You have to have good guard play from mm -hmm. actual guards. Um, and I, yeah, for me, Vision 6 9 is over. Um, you've seen all you need to see in terms of what it can produce. Uh, and I, I think you have to get a bit more conventional. I've said this, um, you know, about championship teams in the past uh, that you look at any championship team in any sport the, the <laughs> best teams are the ones who can operate like a swiss army knife and yep. can go into uh, a game uh, a series whatever it is being able to play in different ways uh, and and do whatever needs to get done based on the requirements of that matchup and mm -hmm. the raptors have only one way of playing and unless they do that way absolutely perfectly they're going to lose and that is a losing prop proposition. So for me, um, you know, in terms of saving the season and all that, that can still be done. But mm -hmm. I think the front office has to recognize that uh, the weaknesses of this vision are very exposed and glaring and need to be addressed immediately. The irony being and the complicating factor being that the players who are playing the best at the moment are the 6'9 ones, uh, which, uh, you know, kind of makes that difficult to Scotty, obviously, riding the ups and downs of second year life. But, you know, it, 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 Fred Van Vliet, man, it, he's got to be better than he was on, on Monday night. Like, it, it's just, and look, you put yourself in the hole, you lose that game to the Warriors, you make it so it feels like a must win against the Sixers, you put yep. undue pressure on yourselves. Like, it all is just this spiraling, compounding issue. Um, but on the topic of sort of realigning the roster, we're going to get into some trade philosophy stuff coming up in just a second. I talked yesterday about why I think tanking is a dumb idea for a multitude of reasons, and there's more reasons I have for you. I'll get into that today's show. Uh, I want to hear your thoughts as well, Big V, as to sort of what the next move is for the front office. We will do that in just one second. But first, I have to tell you about our friends over at Prize Picks, who have made daily fantasy sports fun, accessible, and easy. Even for me, I'm not a person who likes to play fantasy sports. I've dabbled in Prize Picks when I've been out of province, because Ontario is the only Canadian province in which it is not operational at the moment. But I have dabbled, and it's a lot of fun, because it's not tied to the season-long trials and tribulations, the ups and downs of your fantasy team that you draft the week before the season begins. You get to pick new players each and every night, and guess what? If you're maybe disenchanted with basketball or any other sport, you can go cross-sport. You can mix your entries. You can go soccer with, with hockey, basketball with baseball when that season's going, football obviously going on as well, both college and pro, and you can mix your entries. Enter two to six players in prize picks and simply pick whether they're going to get more or less than a, than a projected stat. If you get them all right you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry you're not competing against other people it's just you against the projections the way it should be safe and fast withdrawals again operational in over 30 states and in canada in every province but ontario at the moment download the prize picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports first time users can receive a 100 instant deposit match up to 100 bucks with the promo code locked on if you deposit 100 bucks, Prize Picks will just put $100 into your account. That's an amazing deal. Don't forget to enter the promo code Locked On and sign up for that instant deposit match for $100 with Prize Picks. Today's show is also brought to you by our friends over at Turo, which is the world's largest car sharing marketplace. With Turo, you can book any car you want, wherever you want it, from a community of local hosts. No more dealing with really, really tiresome and expensive rental companies. Rental cars are like the biggest victims of inflation. It's impossible to rent a car for an affordable price anymore. That's where Turo comes in and where their local hosts come in. They have cars available for any occasion across the US, UK, Canada, and Australia. Book a spacious SUV or minivan if you got the family on a road trip. You can also book a really nice car if maybe you're celebrating something, a honeymoon, a graduation, whatever it might be. 
You can find affordable economy cars if you're on a budget as well and just got to get from A to B. Test drive that new electric vehicle you had your eye on as well to see how it might fit into your everyday life. Many Turo hosts can even deliver the car right to you, which is amazing, as opposed to having to go to the rental company, do all the paperwork, blah, 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 blah. Rental companies suck. Turo doesn't. Every trip is backed by a liability insurance. Terms, conditions, and exclusions apply. Forget boring rental cars, expensive rental cars too, and find your drive at Turo.com. All right, Big V, let's dive in now to the trade stuff. This is the stuff the sickos love. I'm the sicko. I love it too. <laughs> uh, so, the Toronto Raptors, 13 and 18. The, the vultures are already circling. Zach Lowe and his podcast today with Ian Begley talked about how OG Ananobi is like the guy everyone in the league wants, which maybe is your first clue to not trade OG Ananobi. That's just me, though. Uh, <laughs> oh, there's this guy the entire league covets? Hmm, perhaps we keep this guy on the roster. To that point, I, I don't know where you're at right now, Big V, but I do think to your sort of suggestion that something needs to change with the roster constitution. I'm willing to open myself up to the argument for anyone on this roster not named Pascal Siakam, OG Ananobi, or Scotty Barnes getting dealt. And I know there will be some people who say, but Pascal's not a true number one on a championship team. How are you going to win with him? Blah, he's too old. He's 28. That's ridiculous. Uh, there's lots of reasons to keep Siakam in-house. He hasn't agitated for a move. That's the kind of player you tank for to hopefully land one day, and probably won't, mind you, because tanking is by no means a guaranteed operation. In fact, the odds are wildly stacked against you, and the Raptors getting lucky enough to get Scotty Barnes back in 2021 is like a total an anomaly and something you shouldn't be trying to test your luck with again. Especially when you have Scotty Barnes, you think he might be a superstar one day, and you don't want to alienate that guy or sap the supporting cast around which he can thrive and build a team with. It's just there's lots of reasons that I don't need to relitigate because I did it yesterday on the show to not blow the whole thing up. That said, outside of Siakam, OG, and Scotty, I feel like at this point, anything can be argued. I could talk myself into anything. The problem is Fred Van Vliet, in theory, is like the perfect co-star for these guys if he's in his assumed role and he's actually hitting his shots, but that's been a hit or miss proposition this season, so it complicates the whole thing. Big V, where are you at right now? It seems pretty obvious that a move is going to have to happen at some point here. As our friend Blake Murphy pointed out on Twitter a couple days ago, there's a track record of Masai Ujiri reacting to losing streaks with big trades. The Rudy Gay trade came on the heels of a five-game losing streak. The P.J. Tucker and Serge Ibaka additions came on the heels of a really miserable January for that 16-17 team. There's a track record here of him reacting to bad results with a move. Where are you at right now? What should that next move be? And who could potentially be on the way out in order to rebalance, reshuffle this roster around those three guys who you may or may not want to keep? Maybe you want to send Pascal off. Who's to say? Uh, <laughs> where are you at? Well, I think in terms of the roster construction, what you have to evaluate is uh, the need for an additional guard versus the need mm -hmm. for uh, a legitimate center. Mm -hmm. And I think if you want to get more specific with the center position, ideally they ha have to be able to shoot the ball because yeah. um, I think as long as Scotty and Pascal are together, everyone else has to be capable of shooting the ball. Mm -hmm. That would lead to a certain name, Miles Turner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so I think that's, what you really start to look at carefully, ironically, uh, the Indiana Pacers have a better record than the Raptors currently. And yeah, they are they are losing the the plot a little bit though. Should be noted, they're they're <laughs> on their way back to where I think the Pacers are, you know, projected to be. Which again is another reason why it's really hard to tank into any sort of meaningful lottery range. But, but right. On. So as far as need goes, I think the interesting thing here is, and I mean we discussed it the last time I was on, I believe, mm -hmm. was uh, what Scotty's best defensive position. Yeah. Right? And so if you can't... Right now, it's center. Top. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right? And so if that is his best position and that's where you want to commit to uh, in the near future, then maybe that changes the dynamic. And so you do look at the additional guard mm -hmm. and what that brings to the table. Um guard slash forward you know we've we talked about uh 
the Bogdanovi. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we'll leave it at that. But I, I think those are the options that are pretty much there for uh, a bunch of teams around the league. So mm -hmm. now it comes down to cost as well. And so yeah. what are you willing to put up uh, for that? So I think I would lean towards um, the guard spot right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with the center position, uh, you roll with Scotty there for now. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I, I feel like a, a guard that can shoot... Uh, whether it's a combo, whether it's someone like Detroit Bogdanovich that can play a bit of forward, um, mm -hmm. that's what you would look at. Uh, but the center position, I think, could cascade into other moves because, mm -hmm. again, we get back into that Scotty Pascal conversation. Yeah, I mean, the thing with Miles Turner, look, I, I think the fear of a lot of people of the Raptors not sort of just selling off for futures and saying, hey, well, let's try to like salvage this team. The fear is like it's a short-term move, right? And, and I think any move you make this year has to have next year in mind as well. And, and I think it's a little reductive to be like, well, you can't go trade assets now because they're not good right now. Like, no, like this is an investment. You have Scotty Barnes and Pascal Siakam and OG Ananobi on your team, all three of whom you want to keep, two of whom are coming up for extensions very soon. And you want to show, hey, like there's a plan here in place for what's going to come up. And to just like ship off Fred and Gary Trent Jr. without a plan of how to replace them and supplement the core you're building, that, you know, I, I could see why that is, you know, for me at least, that like I get why people want to do that. Picks are nice. Everyone loves picks. I don't think you can just go and, you know, add picks to the roster and say, Pascal, Scotty, you like this, right? Uh, yeah, like that's not, the, the veterans don't care about that. Pascal Siakam doesn't care about playing with more first round picks. Um, you know, you want to build an actual real team around them. And I suppose there's like an outcome here where, and I was kicking this idea around with a, a various, a, a Toronto based podcaster who I'm not going to out on the podcast, but um, we were kicking this around the idea of, hey, do you like, do the Westbrook trade with Gary and Fred Van Vliet and get the picks and then ship those picks off in the summer as sort of like a rebalancing thing for Carl Anthony Towns. Um, but uh, <laughs> like, is that something you do? Or it, it's, it's difficult to sort of plot this thing forward. The point is you have to have next year's team in mind and you have to, I think, be constantly sort of thinking, what is the constitution of the team around the three core guys? Because the three core guys are what matters right now. And so it gets really tricky. Are you getting someone who fits better with the core guys than Fred Van Vliet in a trade this year? Probably not, right? Like on paper, Fred Van Vliet's a perfect fit along those guys. And so I wonder if maybe the center is kind of where I skew in my thinking. And that's where Miles Turner comes in. And if you can go and get Miles Turner, you can sign him with your with the bird rights. They've got a track record of doing this with guys with Serge Ibaka. They've done this with all sorts of guys, traded for them and then signed them and kept them in town. Is that the way you plot it forward? Make Miles Turner one of your core guys if the Pacers are game to trade him and say the Fred thing we can figure out in the summer. Maybe he opts into his contract at this rate. Maybe this is something we can kind of kick down the, the, down the road a little bit and sort of address your biggest glaring hole at center with a guy who can be part of the team going forward long term. It's not easy though, man. It's really like a complex trade environment. The Raptors are in a weird spot, but they're not a typical on the verge of tearing it down team. They're not the Bulls who have no hope or assets. They're not the Wizards who have failed to draft any good players in the last like 700 drafts. They're not these teams that are, you know, getting ready for a long term sort of many years of pain. If you go for many years of pain with this team, you're going to be having more years of pain because Pascal Siakam is going to be packing his bags and Scotty Barnes' agitation won't be long after if you can't build a roster around them. So it's not very easy. And I know I just talked for like five minutes without much direction, but like it, it's, it, I mean, this is why the front office gets the big bucks, big bucks, I suppose, V. Yep. Yep. That's <laughs> certainly what they've got a, a show right now. Um, I think. The interesting thing, the difficult thing that has to enter the equation now as well mm -hmm. is 
as Scotty went on his incredible rookie of the year campaign last mm. year, we said that, or I said, I'll, I'll own it. Yeah. Um, I said that the great thing about this is now you're able to um, marry this 2021, 20, 22 year old core that you might have with mm. uh, Pascal and Fred. Yeah. Uh, you can have future and present together. Mm -hmm. It's pretty clear that Scotty is going to need more time. Sure. And that may not be true anymore. Um, and so that's where you might be forced into a choice. Mm. Uh, I agree with you. If you shift younger and away from uh, you know, pa Fred, Pascal, whoever it might be, then you're certainly, you know, putting yourself uh, into a longer growth trajectory um, mm -hmm. and losing trajectory. You lean the other way and you put yourself probably in a more win now proposition. Mm -hmm. But I do think that as things stand, uh, that might have to be something that is evaluated in terms of what, how much the timelines uh, sort of um, collide here and mm -hmm. now. I guess I still am optimistic that the timelines can be married. I, I'm not the type of person who thinks you have to have all your players be the same age. And if you extend Pascal, and I mean, at this rate, the way their team is playing... You know, this also, this shouldn't be a factor, but it is with the way the cap realities are. The Raptors continue to play this way. I feel like it's probably a long shot Siakam does get voted to All-NBA, even if he'll be deserving just based on his merit. Like, it's just how it works. Bad teams usually don't get All-NBA guys. That lowers what his extension's going to be. You can extend Siakam. He's still going to be good. Like, I, I don't see him having, like, a precipitous drop-off. He's so based on feel and touch. Yep. And, like, it, he just feels like a guy who's going to age pretty gracefully to me. He kind of feels like, honestly, like DeMar in, in that way. Where yep. it's just, like, it's footwork. It's, you know, being elusive. It, it's stuff that should age pretty well. Especially if he can kind of, you know, continue to shoot threes at something, you know, around an average rate. I, there's no reason to me why Scotty Barnes in year four or five can't still be on the same team as Pascal Siakam in a couple of years and the team still be very good built around those two guys. Like, I, I think that's a totally reasonable thing to think. And I know Scotty's had himself some ups and downs, but I still think we see the flashes of like what peak Scotty can be. And the idea of pairing that player with Pascal Siakam is still extremely tantalizing to me. And so I'm less inclined to say you got to make a choice on the timeline i'll also admit i am like super pro pascal siakam i'm hella bought in i'm totally siakam pilled and maybe my bias is clouding all of this but i also think pascal siakam is the type of player that you do everything you can to keep around even if you don't fancy him a Giannis Antetokounmpo level he's going to drive your team to contention every single season it's still not good business to be trading away good players like that, excellent players like that, when they're not agitating to be traded. It, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. And so I still think there's a window here of three, four, five years with Pascal Siakam on the team that Scotty Barnes can grow into. It might take longer than we thought, which maybe moves guys like Fred Van Vliet out of the conversation as he ages, his contract situation gets more complicated. But to me, the Siakam-Barnes duo is still a duo worth banking on long-term and building the team around. Like one thing to sort of further expand that thought out is um, based on what we were thinking of, say, Scotty, by the end of last season mm. was uh, for me, I was like, oh, like he might be like an all NBA potential guy by the end of his rookie contract. So his yeah. fourth year, fifth year, sure. um, that is looking like a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you push him out now to say getting there in say year seven, um, which is five years from now, mm. now you're pushing yourself to the end of Pascal. So, right. Sure. Yeah. And so that's where it's like, you, these are these are the decisions. These are the things that I think now the front office has to have conversations about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas maybe we took that for granted in the off season. Yeah.
Uh, so I'm not saying that there is a clear answer here, but I mm-hmm. think it is something that has to be discussed. Coming up on a future episode of Locked On Raptors, who you got, Scotty or Pascal? It's going to get real <laughs> ghoulish up in here. We're going to come back on the other side, get to the good, the bad, and the hmm from the game last night against the old Sixers. Before we do that, however, I want to tell you about our friends over at Express VPN. We all know that Express VPN protects your privacy and security online, right? But there's something you might not know. You can also use Express VPN to unlock movies and shows that are only available in other countries. Maybe you run out of stuff to watch on Netflix. This will change your world. Express VPN allows you to binge whatever show it is that you want. Maybe you want to catch up on The Office UK, that brand new show that everybody is talking about. You can go check that out and, and, and watch it at your leisure through ExpressVPN because it, te- it lets you control where the sites think you are located, which is beautiful. Also, a beautiful thing about this is sports become a whole lot easier to watch. The BBC, for example, has all sorts of sports you can go tune into, all sorts of sports across the pond available for free on cable, but you can't watch them here. you got to pay for insanely expensive subscriptions to watch the Premier League now to get your soccer fix after the World Cup is over. Get ExpressVPN, baby, and dial into those games for free because the site thinks you're in the UK. Proper, in it. So if you want to get access to hundreds of new shows, go to expressvpn.com slash locked on right now, and you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn.com slash locked on, expressvpn.com slash locked on to learn more. All right, we've reached the good, the bad, and the hmm from last night's game against the Sixers. The good, Big V, what you got? Give me something good to feel good about. (laughs) I mean, it's a very obvious answer. Mm -hmm. Uh to go with pascal but i think we have to talk about him i think he's incredible he's so good (laughs) holy hell he's incredible you pick him over scotty i've said it okay sorry (laughs) (laughs) i think with pascal uh you know the mid-range was missing a little bit uh, after coming back from the injury Mm -hmm. and so to see him rely on it and shoot it with supreme confidence was very encouraging um, this is kind of the complete bag that we were seeing at the beginning of the season. And mm-hmm. it really leaves defenders uh, like PJ Tucker saying, please stop. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Credit and... to PJ, though. He ratcheted it up in overtime. Didn't know he had it in him, the old, the old bugger, but he did. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think that part of it was uh, great to see. Um, that third quarter stretch was incredible. The... Mm-hmm. The sequence at the end of the fourth quarter where, you know, he grabs that rebound out of nowhere, comes down the floor, hits that tough banker, Hmm. then gets the stop on Embiid as well. Uh, I will go with that as my good. Yeah, hard to argue with that. Just as an addendum to that, uh, before I get to my good, I I think... The end of the third quarter where Nick Nurse goes offense uh, and brings Siakam in for the last play of the quarter and he bangs the three in, like, baby, that is uh, good coaching. Like, I know Nick Nurse is getting a lot of heat lately and some of it fair, but that was a really good button to press. Also, I mean, that it's a real bummer that that game tying finger roll, like, while spread eagle in the air is going to be lost to history as a bucket that tied a game that they lost eventually. But man, what a play by Pascal. He's really good. He's really, really, really good. Uh, My good is uh, Juancho Hernan Gomez's off-ball movement. It's like the only thing that moves in the Raptors' offense, and it's delightful to behold, especially when he's playing with Thad Young, who I guess you could also kind of give the nod to as a good, uh, and, you know, maybe him getting subbed out in the last couple minutes for Scotty was not the right decision from Nick Nurse. If we're going to be balanced in our coverage of Nick Nurse, thought Thad was doing a really nice job and was a big part of a lot of the best stretches for the Raptors. Um, But yeah, Wancho moving off ball. Love it. You know, do I love Wancho starting? I don't think that says a lot about the state of your team if he is starting, but if he's there to be a a piece, a little bench hand, uh, really, really been enjoying. He's been a pleasant surprise this season, I think, Wancho Hernan Gomez. Let's go to the bad. Gestures broadly. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, For me, Big V, I I think my bad is like the the oscillations of Scotty Barnes. And it's not that I don't think that they're, you know, part of the deal, because I do. He's a second year player. These things are hard. It's not a linear thing for everybody. But when the oscillations are happening at a time where the team just desperately needs to get a W to get off the schneid, like, 
man, it would be really great to see like just a through line of consistent Scotty Barnes performances. They're not getting it. That's my bad. What's your bad? My bad was the second quarter stretch. Yep, uh, that stunk. You had a one point <laughs> lead, and you know, a couple blinks, and it's a, you're down twelve. And mm. Pascal has to come back into the game. And I think uh, the lack of resistance that group showed was just flat out embarrassing. I mean, mm-hmm. they were off made baskets. The Philadelphia 76ers, who are not known for running. Mm-hmm. In fact, push- they detest it. Have you seen <laughs> their guys? They're like me when it comes to running. Hate it. <laughs> they are, are pushing it down your throat. And they're just driving by you for layups. I, mm-hmm. I think that was uh, embarrassing um, and pathetic. And, you know, realistically, Nick has got to find a way to stagger, uh, you know, Fred and Pascal. Yeah. Uh, And I think, you know, little stretches like that where you 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 sort of aren't I I think attentive would be the wrong word Mm. uh, because I think he's really just trying to give those guys a chance. But uh, I, I think. You know, I think you got to stick to your guns, and he's been a, a hard ass coach. And I think that was time <laughs> to just be like, hey, this is not working. Yeah. Uh, and pull the plug on it soon enough, uh, early enough. We saw it earlier uh, in this losing streak as well, where he stuck with Coloco for too long. Yeah. And uh, that turned out. So these little f- fragments of the game are, you know, at some point coming back to haunt, haunt the Raptors in very tight losses. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, in theory, I like the idea of Scotty and OG being able to carry bench units. And, you know, I think the addition of a Gary Trent Jr. at full health would be useful in that, you know, sort of endeavor. But it's just not there right now. Might have been too much to ask OG in his first game back to, you know, carry the team with his driving. And, you know, he's normally a walking paint touch. He didn't have his best game last night offensively. Defensively, we, we should probably, you know, pat him on the back. He was as you expect, really, really good. And it's not a surprise the Raptors defense like figured out how to play defense again when he arrived. But yeah, just uh, not enough in that second quarter. You're not getting enough in those non-Siakam Fred minutes. And it's a shame because Siakam and Fred, in theory, a wonderful pair to stagger with three bench guys as well because they can kind of carry your lineup offensively. If you could have it so Scotty and OG could do the same, that would be fantastic. But that's not happening at the moment. That's a worthy bad. Let's get to the hmm... My hmm was going to be a little bit of a bigger question uh, regarding Pascal Siakam's place in Raptors history. We don't have time for that. Uh, So we're going to save that for another day. Uh, I'll just like, uh, can I just hmm and pat myself on the back for a thing I said on the show yesterday? They should not be playing Christian Coloco anymore. Ken Burch should get a shot. Look, Ken Burch wasn't amazing or anything like that, but uh, and it turns out Thad Young is still the best center on the team. But I think that was a right call by Nick Nurse to not throw Christian Coloco to the wolf that is Joel Embiid. And I like the idea of starting with Wancho, even if you know it's small and they had to really, really overhelp to to get the ball out of Embiid's hands. It worked. They had a really good defensive game, all told, outside of a couple of breakdowns here and there um, yep. in the late going. And so, uh, you know, I'm just gonna instead of doing a hmm, I'm just gonna pat myself on the back for a previous hmm of mine. What's yeah. yours, Big V? So my hmm is about uh, OG Ananobi. I think yep. that uh, obviously we know he sat for his hip, but he was yep. also sitting for finger issues and he comes in and he shoots three for seven from deep. So looks good on the stroke. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, we got to see how that plays out. It's mm-hmm. just one game, but hopefully that break is what he needed to get that shooting percentage up because that is the only thing that has been missing from an outstanding season. And it was absolutely fantastic to see OG back. Sure was. Uh, Big V, it was fantastic to see you on my computer screen across from me, uh, as it always is. Anything you would like to promote for the good people out there as we bring this show to a close? Uh, usual stuff, man. Raptors.com. Uh, my CTV run is over. so It's a damn shame. It was a glorious Lionel Messi level run. But, uh, <laughs> you know, all things come to an end, I suppose. Thank Time you, is thank undefeated. You. <laughs> well, if you wanted to read my thoughts on the final, you can still do that. The Story is pinned to my Twitter profile, and you can follow me on Twitter at Vivek M. Jacob. 
does the the piece just read that was good uh <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> that kicked ass that whipped uh yeah what a man, i'm what i'm still thinking fun. about it i might just go watch it back to feel something we'll see yeah uh we're gonna wrap it there thanks so much for tuning in we'll be back again tomorrow katie heindel's gonna pop by usually we'll uh work on some sort of fun little parlor game with katie so we'll figure that out then until then please go make your second listen of the day locked on sports today with pete bukowski breaking down all the news from around the sports world the biggest stuff across the world of sports in 22 minutes or less each and every morning go check it out it's a wonderful show it's available wherever you get your podcast and on youtube as is this show please support subscribe rate review yada 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 you've heard the spiel a bazillion times by now if you haven't listened yet you're probably never going to listen but please do it's christmas it's your gift to me is to support my stuff peer pressure we like it uh that'll do it we'll talk to you wednesday Bye bye